Hello, I'm Mally Schantzfeld, Managing Editor of Endodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to an educational presentation and question and answer with Dr. Ryan Walsh. In our webinar today, we will be discussing how effective communication plays a crucial role in outstanding patient care, both in the dental chair and beyond. Dr. Walsh will also address techniques to reinvent your endodontic treatment in a bioactive world. Before we get started, I'd like to invite viewers to use the question and answer box to ask any questions, and they'll be answered at the end of the session as time permits. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ryan M. Walsh. For over a decade, Dr. Walsh has been educating dentists and endodontists on providing the highest level of evidence-based, patient-centered endodontic care. As a board-certified endodontist, he is well-informed of the latest techniques in clinical and patient management. Dr. Walsh is actively involved in translational and clinical research, focusing on bioactive materials, resorption processes and treatments, irrigation techniques, and tooth cracks and fractures. He has been published in multiple peer-reviewed journals and is presented to both national and international audiences. Dr. Walsh maintains a full-time private practice exclusive to endodontics in Keller, Texas. When not in private practice, he teaches endodontic residents and dental students at Texas A&M College of Dentistry in Dallas, Texas, about the latest advances in endodontics. Dr. Walsh is a diplomate of the American Board of Endodontics, member of the American Association of Endodontists, American Dental Association, and Texas Dental Association. He's also the past president of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex Endodontic Society and a founding board member of the Seattle Study Club of Fort Worth. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Walsh. We now turn over the webinar to you to learn more about this interesting topic. Great. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and, and thank you, as always, to, for, for having me here this evening. So I, I appreciate this opportunity and, uh, and your support. And so let's let's kind of dive into things here. And so the, the topic for this evening is complete endodontic success from root canals to patient reviews. So in my mind, you know, we can be great clinicians, but if we aren't good communicators, then all of that is for naught. You know, I think that goes uh, from everything from actually doing the root canal procedure and having relationship with our patient to having good relationships with our referrals and other dentists, as well as our colleagues. And so I think we can all train to be good clinicians, but we need to also be effective communicators. And so I'd like to try to tie both of those topics in here this evening. And we'll talk about something near and dear to my heart, obviously, as an endodontist, we'll talk about root canals and then how to translate that into effective communication skills. So um, I'm from Iowa, born and raised in Iowa, went to college and dental school at the University of Iowa, and here I am in Texas. And as they say in Texas, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. And so I got my residency, or I did my residency at Texas A&M over in Dallas, and I've been in private practice for the last 10 years here at Advanced Endo of Texas. But I still like to maintain my uh, adjunct faculty down at Texas A&M because it gets me out of private practice once in a while and it kind of gets me, keeps me in touch with the latest and greatest as well as the, the passion for learning from the endodontic residents and students. And so uh, I really enjoy my time being spent down there. And my contact is below my email, my Facebook and my Instagram. So don't hesitate to, to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. I'm always happy to, to help out and, and would love to hear what you guys are doing. So when I'm not doing root canals, on the left is Texas A&M and their old clinic. Uh, they have a beautiful new building these days. And so now we're over there. But nonetheless, I like to spend my time there or with my girls. So I have three beautiful daughters. I have an almost six-year-old and twin three-year-olds. So just like a lot of you guys, I'm, I'm uh, balancing work and life all at the same time. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So I love getting to spend time with my daughters and my beautiful wife, Lindsay. I certainly wouldn't be here without her. And she's a dentist and she provides feedback for me and puts up with countless hours of, of listening to me uh, bounce ideas off her for my talk. So without her, again, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at, as well as my work colleagues. So again, I am in private practice most of the time. I like to carve out time to do things like this. And, and for events like this, uh, I do receive honoraria to talk about my experiences. However, uh, I like to present them with an honest, unbiased opinion, as well as uh, the best evidence-based clinical practice that I can bring to you. So tonight, just touching on a few things, let's talk about bioceramic and bioactive materials. Really, what's the difference? Is the, Are they one and the same? Let's talk about how to incorporate those into your practice. And then let's spend the, the back part of the lecture talking about good communication and how we're going to be good clinicians and good communicators and tie that all together in one big package. 
And as we're going through things this evening, I'd like you to keep one thing in mind. And I think this is so critical to everything that we do in dentistry. Uh, and it comes from Sam Sneed. I'm a golfer, and so I love following golf, uh, both you know on, in TV, on TV and as well as playing it. Uh, but don't just play your way around the course. Think your way around the course, and that applies to dentistry as well. Don't just don't just do what you're doing because that's how you've always been doing it. Well, think is that the most logical, the best practice that you can bring to your patients? And let's think our way through some of these things. And so you'll see that theme recur a few times throughout this evening. So let's start with. Bioceramics. You know, what are bioceramics? Well, bioceramics are things that we see every day in our practices and every day in our worlds because they're things like orthodontic brackets, crowns, whether they're zirconia, lithium disilicate, and we have zirconia implant abutments. In the top right picture here is an artificial hip. So we have bioceramics all over us or all around us, and, and some people have them within us. And so bioceramics are so common and really popular in everyday use. But what do I mean when I'm talking about bioceramics specifically in relation to endodontics? Well, more specifically, I'm discussing bioactive bioceramics. And that's important because bioceramics uh, in the top row in kind of the most basic sense just means anything that's a ceramic material inserted into the body, hence bio and ceramic. But I'm not talking about just plug in a hole or fill in a cavity. You know, we're talking about stimulating healing. We're talking about inducing body response and promoting uh, the tissue regrowth or regeneration process. And so bioactive bioceramics are things like bioactive sealers, MTA-based materials. We nowadays have some bioglass incorporated composites and resins. So I've kind of divided those in two. Those to the, the right of the picture here are going to be bioglass type of products, whereas the, the products on the left are going to be more... Uh, tricalcium silicate or MTA-like materials. And, and we'll dive a little bit more into that as we get going. So why is this important to you? Well, ever since th this uh, statistic was published in 2017, we've just been on a steady upward trend with bioceramics becoming more and more popular and more and more available to us in private practice. And so in 2017, it was a $12.5 billion industry in US dollars. That's huge. I mean, that's billion with a B. And so today, six years later, I can only help, I can't help but think that this is still on that incredible upward trajectory because now bioceramics are everywhere. It doesn't seem like you can uh, open up a, a dental journal or open up a magazine and not see some type of bioactive or uh, biomimetic material being used these days. So it's it's emerging there, or it's, uh, it's past emerging, it's prevalent in our dental culture. So we need to be familiar with what these things are. And we're not like dentists or endodontists of the past. You know, I'm, I'm not just a root canalist. I'm not here just drilling and filling or reaming and screaming in pulps. And likewise, we're no longer just filling holes. We're so much more than that these days. You know, truly, we're interacting with biological tissues. Here's just a quick example of a very nice pulpotomy from my colleague, Dr. Saeed Attar. And you can see that that dentin bridging directly beneath uh, the MTA-like material. Not only is there M or, uh, dentin bridging, but these root apices have begun to form or continue to develop. So we're allowing the body to do what it does, and that's heal and grow and repair itself. And we're stimulating tissues. This is an apico surgery of mine. This is a three-year recall, and you can see there's bone deposition directly over the root end filling. And that's incredible. We're not just forming a fibrous scar, we're stimulating tissue growth. And what does that mean? Well, moreover, we're promoting bioactivity. You know, here's a study that, I, that we did and we published back in 2016, 2017. And what this is showing is the root end in a canine model. And this is a root tip of a lower molar that had an osteotomy for a root end procedure. So at the time of treatment, this was completely devoid of bone. There was nothing there but just airspace, if you will, or uh, blood clot. This is three months post-op, and what we're seeing is AB is alveolar bone. We're seeing the bone regenerate. P is periodontal ligament. We're seeing that reform, and the little arrow that you see is pointing to a calcified or mineralized tissue directly over the apex of the NeoMTA+, and that's showing cementum. So we're not just stimulating healing, but we're stimulating regeneration of, bi of biological tissues in the correct location, in the correct place that weren't there before. So to me, this is just an amazing process, an amazing field in dentistry that
that we're becoming uh, so accustomed to and these materials are so readily available. But I think the next question is, well, how are these materials even working? You know, what what's the underlying process? You know, it's not just hocus pocus. It's not just, you know, magic fairy dust. We sprinkle on a tooth and get these tissues to regenerate. No, it's it's much more complicated than that. And so let's start with something very simple. You know, let's start with what we see in the mouth, the clinical crowns. And so these teeth are showing, uh, are representative of teeth being bathed in saliva. And as we know, saliva, gingival cravicular fluid, pretty much everywhere in the oral environment is <clears throat> full of different types of ions, whether they're calcium, phosphate, fluoride ions that we bring in uh, through toothpaste, through water, things like that. So there's a constant exchanging of ions on our tooth surface. And I think the most common one is probably fluoride. That's the one we're most commonly familiar with in the sense that if we can incorporate fluoride into the hydroxyapatite matrix, fluorohydroxyapatite is much more resistant to decay than it's just hydroxyapatite. So this is just that's just one very common example of how we're using bioactive materials on a molecular level to stimulate this healing. So there's a lot of different buzzwords being thrown around, you know, bioactive, bioinert, bioinductive, bioconductive, biomimetic. You know, what do all these really mean? And how do they really play? Because sometimes they're one in the same. In my mind, sometimes bioactive and bioinductive are insinuating the same thing. And then, you know, biomimetic, again, is that truly an accurate description of what's going on? Because I could use a bioactive material here at the uh, at the cable surface margin or the gingival seat of a deep caries restoration. Well, I could use some bioinductive properties uh, at the root tip to stimulate uh, periapical radiolucent healing. And what about bioinert, things that aren't really interacting? Well, your, your run-of-the-mill bread and butter core materials, yeah, internal in the tooth structure, probably don't need to be bioactive or bioinductive. And what about biomimetic? Or, you know, that's mimicking the biological tissues. Well, yeah, maybe to some extent we're biomimetic and uh, some materials probably more so than others. But again, moreover, we're, we're stimulating biological activity. And so what's the difference between the crown structures and the root structures? Well, I mean, I think the simple, simple answer is, well, one is exposed to the oral environment and the other isn't. You know, one's encased in bone and the other is exposed to saliva. Well, let's take a look at this a little bit more in depth. Let's start with the crown down, and let's start with bioactive materials used in the oral environment. Let's start with things that we're using for fillings and restorations that we see clinically in the oral cavity. So before we touch base there, I just want to re review the basic process of demin and remin. Again, we've talked about this constant equilibrium or constant interchange of ions between the oral environment and the tooth structure. Right? So just kind of as a reminder, you know, the, the critical pH is 5.5, below which we, we stimulate the demineralization process, where the acidic environment then uh, starts to break down the enamel structure and allows release of calcium and phosphate ions, or starts to break down that hydroxyapatite matrix. We'll swing to the other uh, end of the spectrum, and we have remin, where if we have a, a higher pH and a sufficient concentration of uh, available calcium and phosphate ions, well, the tooth can then absorb or interact with those and incorporate that into the hydroxyapatite matrix and remineralize hard tissue. So what does that look like? These are some wonderful uh, photomicrographs from Dr. James Wafel out of the University of Iowa. He was my cariology teacher when I was in dental school, and these images have stuck with me ever since, and so I wanted to bring them to you. So let's start on the left. The top photo, photo A here, is kind of a, an incipient lesion. In other words, there's you see some enamel breakdown, but you have the body of the lesion. And here we're looking at the outermost layer of enamel, which is kind of the whitish blue, and the darker blues down below at the bottom uh, surrounding the A. And so here, this is what we'd call you know incipient caries. These are the ones that potentially could remend. These are your classic boards lesions, or you know maybe not quite. They're still a little shallow for boards. Maybe the the, the better boards lesion, if you will, is the uh, one in, in picture B, where that surface zone and the body of the lesion have increased over time, and they've gone from the outer surface of enamel down just kissing the DEJ. And so that's caries. I mean, that at that point, once we're touching the DEJ, that is caries. That's treatable, 
do a filling, we need to intervene type of caries. Well, the opposite is also true. If we have a lesion over on the remen side that where the body of the lesion is still maintained in enamel, well, we have opportunity. You know, as dentists, we don't need to rush and, and necessarily treat these, especially in a low caries risk patient. We have an opportunity to potentially remend some of these areas. And so, again, putting a material that will allow the, the calcium phosphate type of ions and fluoride ions into this area can stimulate the body to do what it does best, and that's heal and remineralize those tissues. And so there's a material on the market uh, called Regen. And Regen is a bioactive composite resin. I use this in my practice. I'll show you some examples of that. But this is really a unique product because it uses bioglass. So back going back to the one of the original diagrams, looking at tricalcium silicate or MTA-like versus bioglass type restorations. And here we're going to focus on the bioglass because we're in the oral environment. And bioglass has some very unique properties, especially if it's incorporated into a resin matrix. It doesn't necessarily dissolve or resort over time. It's continuously interacting with this oral environment. And so it does a couple things for us. It will uh, release and absorb calcium and phosphate ions. So again, going back to our re, uh, re and D-min, if we have an abundance of calcium and phosphate ions and we have a favorable pH, well, we can re two structure and or prevent d -min, okay? But we also have the benefit here that bioglass is a buffer. And I'll show you that in just a few moments. But a buffer is critically important in the oral environment because we can see in our dry mouth patients where they don't have any buffering saliva effect that we have a higher caries risk. So in, uh, in our everyday patients, including those with, with high caries risk and dry mouth, that if we're placing a deeper restoration and we have a potential to use a restoration that buffers the local environment and also provides those ions that could help re-min, why would we not use this? That's the perfect case for this. And Regen provides both of those properties for us. So taking a tooth with, with caries. Yes, there's some pulp inflammation here. And so that draws my attention immediately as the endodontist. But what I want you to focus on most is the actual decay, where it's located. We know that many times caries start below the, the level of contact, right? Or at or below the level of contact. And that's because that's a hard area to keep clean. You know, if you, we, we jokingly say only floss the teeth you want to keep because flossing really gets in and removes that interproximal plaque stagnation and, and again, removes that bacteria that's decreasing that pH leading to DMIN. So if we have, if we have a tooth like this, you know, conventionally, we treat it like this. Right? So we'd remove that mesial caries, and some of that's probably going to extend on the occlusal. And, you know, yes, I may be going back to a little bit of GV black here, but nonetheless, we're removing the unhealthy tooth structure uh, and trying to get clean margins, which, again, I think there's some debate there, but bear with me. I want to remove the, the gross caries to prevent leaving any caries behind, which could cause failure of the restoration because of care, recurrent caries. So when we're looking here and we're looking at this interproximal area, you know, to me, the gingival seed is the critical zone. This is the most important part in this restoration and also the weakest part of this restoration because this person's already got, uh, already has decay or had already uh, experienced a caries lesion interproximally. So we know that they're having a hard time cleaning that area. Now we're going to remove it and we're going to put an interface there. It's not just like we're re replacing enamel. Now we're going to put a very technique sensitive composite resin adjacent to two structure. And we're going to bond those together. And we're going to do that at the most critical part or the weakest part of the restoration tooth interface. So why is that important? Well, again, let's think about what's going on. Let's think our way through this process and see how we can circumvent having problems here. So this is a case that I treated. This is a patient of mine we've seen before. He has caries both in approximately on uh, 18 and 19. So if if I'm removing this decay, yes, it's deep. We know that's we know that to begin with. So if it's deep caries, we know this person has a hard time keeping this area clean. I don't just want to put a regular composite there that's bonded to tooth because we know that that is a very uh, potentially weak interface, not because our bonding's bad, but just because we know the average composite resin lasts between five and eight years. 
and it's a very technique sensitive the deeper we go it's not tolerant to moisture so all of those things are leading to well is that the best restoration to put here but if we place a material like regen and we place that at the critical zone now we're kind of one step ahead of the process so yes we're removing the decay and yes we're still creating a composite tooth interface at that area however the material that we're putting there is releasing calcium and phosphate ions it's absorbing calcium and phosphate ions and it's buffering the local environment so it's not the local environment isn't able to reduce past that critical 5.5 ph it's going to maintain that higher than the pH needed for DMIN, and it's going to be releasing the ions that are critical to promote remin. So to me, we've found a, a really logical solution to a problem that we've been stuck with for 30, 40 years with composite restorations. Now we have one that will help prevent recurrent decay and has the ions and has the infrastructure present to promote remineralization. So my general dentist was, was kind enough to send me a couple of his uh, prep pictures. And what you can see is the bright white area, that's the regen material. And I really only use that at the, uh, at the most peripheral portion of the restoration because that's the part that's going to be most likely to be in contact with oral saliva. If we needed to margin or elevate the margin, that's going to be the, the part that's exposed to the oral environment. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, we can use the bioinert material for the main bulk of the core because there's really no exposure to the oral environment there. That's a low risk restoration. The area that we want to have biological activity or to have bioactivity is that gingival seat. And that's where I'm using regen to promote that bioactivity at the deepest area. So here's a really cool study or a really cool experiment uh, that, that they've done with regen. And here you see two composite discs. They are different colors simply so that we can tell the composite apart. You know, one's a, a two and one's a 3.5. They took the saliva or they took the composite discs, submerged them in artificial saliva, and then evaluated the surface texture. And you can see one of these things is not like the others. The one on the right is nice and glassy smooth. And the one on the left looks kind of pebbled. Well, the pebbling on the left is regen. And what we are seeing on the surface is deposition of calcium phosphate from the artificial saliva. So this is further showing that when you're putting regular composite and regen bioactive composite in, into an artificial saliva, you're promoting this deposition of calcium and phosphate on the surface. So again, take that back to that deep caries model where we have a weak interface because it's deep, it's moisture prone, and the patient already has, has caries in that location. And now we can stimulate calcium and phosphate formation. That's fantastic. We're one step ahead to providing a more long-term, uh, more long-term restoration for that patient. But not only that, but I've talked earlier about it being buffering. So when we're looking at this, it's kind of a split diagram. Anytime you see the color pink, that means the pH is above eight. So we're basic. Anytime you see it yellow, we know that's an acidic environment. And so what I want to show you is one of these solutions contains uh, regen bio and bioglass, and the other is not. So think of it as regular composite and regen composite. And I'm going to hit this uh, hit play so we can watch. What they're doing is they're adding lactic acid, trying to drop that pH. And you see initially that both solutions, the pH drops. But what you see on the left hand with regen is that it comes back up to that pH of above eight. Again, buffering the local environment getting it out of a potentially caries promoting environment and bringing that pH up. Again, you're seeing this happen. So the bioglass has this unique capability to continue to buffer and continue to serve as a source of bioactivity. So it's not just a one and done. It's not just a, it releases these ions until they're depleted. It's continuously interacting. So it's somewhat recharging and then, uh, then eluding these ions when the environment needs it. So again, you're seeing this in live time, just the continuation and continuous buffering effect. So to me, this is an incredible advancement in composite restoration technology where we're inducing, or we have the potential to induce bioactivity at one of the, the weakest junctions that we know in dentistry. So what about something like this? I think we've all seen an uptick in resorption cases. 
a recent study that we just that we just published showed that that we're identifying them uh, over two times more often the past decade or the past five years than we were the previous five years. So I think we're all seeing an uptick in resorption. But when we get a case like this, I think all of us kind of, you know, put our he head in our hand and say, oh, man, if only we'd have caught this earlier. Well, I agree. I'm not saying that I don't wish we would have caught this earlier, but I think now we have some materials that we can actually treat these teeth with, with more predictability. Yes, yeah, still, there's some variability in how much resorption we can remove and, and will it recur or not. But if we want to think of the caries interface and the, car the interproximal caries interface as a critical zone, well, this is going to be an incredibly or a very critical zone, because if you imagine what the prep's going to look like on number 30 here, on the, on the lingual side, even if you do a nice conservative prep, you're going to be exposing some of the resorption. So if we can repair that internally, or if we can restore that resorptive tissue internally with a material that will allow us to put our margin on it and prevent re uh, recurrence, well, great. Again, we're staying one step ahead of the, the logical progression. So I treated this tooth endodontically. In my buildup, I placed regen because most of the buildup here is going to be uh, is going to have potential exposure to the oral environment, especially along that lingual wall. And because I'm not the one prepping it, I did the whole core with regen because that way, if any surface is exposed, I'm not concerned of uh, I'm not concerned that it only has a regular or bioinert composite. All of its bioactive material. I asked my my general dentist two things. Due to the depth of that resorption, I asked him, A, will you please keep your crown margin on my composite? Please don't go apical to it. That's going to create biologic width issues, and that's going to promote bone loss in that area. Secondly, will you please use a, a radiolucent crown on this tooth? Because if you put a zirconia crown on it, I can't see through. I won't be able to monitor for continued resorption progression. So Dr. Duplantis, a good buddy of mine, and, a, and one hell of a dentist, placed the crown. He did a nice conservative, uh, uh, as super gingival as he could get crown margin, and this was crown margin elevation. He put his lingual crown margin directly onto the regen material, again, because if the regen is exposed to the oral environment, we're not worried about getting recurrent caries in that particular location, because it's going to buffer the local environment. It's going to uh, release calcium and phosphate ions that will stimulate remen in that position if there's ever any concern. Now, I'm not trying to say this is a panacea and an end-all be-all, but it's certainly a, an advantage that our current normal composites don't contain. So if we have a case like this that has some uncertain variables in there, why not use this as a crown margin elevator? This is a perfect case to do so. Well, what about these smooth surface carries? You know, these patients are a challenge in and of themselves because usually there's something promoted, promoting this, you know, whether it's dry mouth, whether it's soda consumption, whether it's you know, meth mouth, something like that. But these are challenging because they're almost all sub G or at least have a subgential component to them. Anytime we get sub G, we know there's going to be moisture uh, contamination and, and it's going to be a challenge to place a bonded restoration, not saying you can't do it and not saying it's not done with success. But there are other restorations that we can place in, in areas like this. You know, what about the long-standing glass ionomers, you know, Riva or Equia Forte or Fuji? Those have been, been around forever and a day and have shown great success in cases like this. So they also contain glasses, uh, bi not bioglass per se, but they contain glasses within a matrix that uh, release fluoride. So in a case like this, where we know if you have sur smooth surface carries, there's something going on. This is the easiest surface to keep clean. Well, if you're having smooth surface caries, we want a material that's going to release fluoride that's going to help prevent having that recurrent caries. And if it's in a moisture-rich environment, well, glass ionomer is great because it forms an ionic bond directly to the tooth structure. You don't need to have that separate bonding step or separate adhesive step to hold on to the composite over here and hold on to the tooth structure here. That's a direct uh, direct adherence. So in smooth surface caries, that's a, a terrific benefit. And again, we're promoting bioactivity. But I want you to think outside the box for a minute. You know, one other advantage of glass ionomers that I think is very often overlooked is the fact that they that they will allow epithelial reattachment to the surface. So here's a paper uh, that 
that my mentor, Dr. Rick Walton, and I uh, published this year in the Journal of Endodontics, talking about an alternative technique for restorative. So let's, let's follow the diagram briefly. So if we have a maxillary premolar with a cusp fracture, we have a few options. Maxillary premolars are the second most common fractured tooth in the mouth behind mandibular molars. You know, mandibular molars, especially the second molar, the most commonly fractured teeth in the mouth by a landslide. Thankfully, the next most commonly fractured tooth is a maxillary premolar. You know, I say thankfully because most of the time, due to our occlusal scheme, the cusp that fractures is the palatal cusp. So in a case... Allow that little defect to granulate in, and most of the time, the gingival tissue will re-adhere with a normal circular probing depth. And our study shows that as well, or has a couple examples of that. Well, sometimes we have a pulp exposure, and in cases like that, we need to do a root canal for the tooth. Well, after we do the root canal, we then have to restore it. And in this particular treatment, I want you to think outside the box because I'm not, I'm not advocating or promoting a crown here. As a matter of fact, I recommend uh, to my general dentist that they don't place a permanent crown to just allow the tooth to become a cuspid instead of a bicuspid, hence our name cuspidization. And so as we follow that down and we treat the tooth with root canal treatment, place the buildup, remove the fractured segment, oftentimes the pulp exposure or the access goes further apical than this diagram shows. And so I like to use a glass ionomer restoration because that will allow that epithelial reattachment to the to the restorative surface. So here's a case, and I treated it apically with bioceramic sealer, and then I came back in with Fuji and restored the missing part of the tooth, or restored the what I'd call the, uh, the cingulum portion of that tooth, and then we allowed it to heal. And you can see doing this type of restoration is relatively cost-effective for the, or doing this type of treatment is relatively cost-effective for that patient. They don't have to worry about a crown. But equally, it's just as aesthetic. Look at this buckle shot here where you can't tell that that's not a bicuspid. And really in this particular case, it doesn't need to function. It only needs to function aesthetically, not mechanically. And so here is a three-year recall of that tooth. And yes, I think this patient uh, has something to be desired for the frequency of flossing. But nonetheless, this has normal probing depths, about three millimeters all the way around, considering this was a sub subcrestal fracture. The glass ionomer is still intact, and the gingival tissue looks relatively healthy in the area. So this is a great potential treatment option for maxillary cusp fractures. Uh, it's, it's not only provides the patient a good service, but it's cost-effective for that patient as well. And not every cusp fracture is amenable to this, but next time you encounter that in your private practice, think about this. And, and if you're going to do that, use some type of glass ionomer to allow that long junctional epithelial attachment back onto the restoration and, and let the body, again, do what it does well, and that's heal and, and provide a biological response. So we've talked briefly, or we've talked a, a bit about what happens in the oral environment, what happens from the, from the crown down. Well, now what about all the tissues that are encased in bone? What about all the tissues below the surface that we haven't talked about so far? Well, those require a little bit different material. So let's focus from the bottom and move up. So, you know, let me ask you, what do you see? I think all of us are going to look at tooth number 19 and say we see you know, a good sized periapical radial lucency, both roots extending up into the furcation. And maybe the cause of that is from a deep composite restoration in the occlusal surface. Potentially, maybe it was. Uh, uh, pulp exposure, we see two different types of material there. They were, maybe they were placing a liner, who knows? But when, when I see this in my practice, well, we're, we're likely going to be doing a root canal. They're at an endodontist office. So I treat the tooth, and this was treated back in 2016. So again, asking you, what do you see? Well, we see now see a, a root canal treatment with a temporary restoration. But if you're observant, you're noticing this small little barrier or small little layer over the gutta percha, and you're probably asking yourself, well, what is that? And that's an orifice barrier. In our office, we use orifice barriers on every case that we do not place a final restoration in. And in this case, it's orangish pink because I like to use Fuji triage or Riva protect. I like to use a glass ionomer in these particular cases because I don't want to have to go through the steps of etch, prime, and bond. 
Also, it's pink, so it's a good visual cue for my general dentist saying, here's where I stopped, please place your restoration on top. But equally, this is a material that self-adheres to the, the surrounding tooth structure with an ionic bond. So this is a great way to use glass ionomer in your practices, or uh, if you're an endodontist, this is a great way to use a glass ionomer and refer that back to your general dentist and provide a good coronal seal for that restoration, or excuse me, good coronal seal for the root canal. Well, this patient was lost to recall and showed up five years later, almost five years later. And what we see is terrific healing apically. You know, that looks great. I was very happy. And interestingly, you know, this wasn't any type of bioactive material. This is Roth root canal cement, uh, very similar to Grossman's original formula. And we still get healing. So what I'm, I'm trying to preface is that you don't have to have bioactive or bio, uh, bioceramic materials to induce healing. However, using those bioactive materials, I think gives us every advantage that we could possibly have. It's kind of like, it's kind of like stacking the deck in your favor, saying, I, I have a few tricks up my sleeve that I know I can throw at some of these cases and get a little bit more predictable healing long-term. But I think it's hard to argue with success. So let me show you why I'm using bioactive materials in my practice, kind of walk you through my timeline uh, of what got me interested in these and, and what got me or what promoted my use in practice. So when I was in residency, um, I was approached by the, the lady who invented uh, Avalon Biomed Neo-MTA. Her name's Carolyn Primus. She's a brilliant, brilliant engineer. And she asked me if I had run a couple experiments on her products. And as a resident, you have to do a research project. So I was thrilled that somebody like this was coming to me. So my first project was evaluating compressive strength of bioactive materials. And I really don't know what that provided uh, to the overall literature basis but it stemmed several different projects and stem uh, really triggered my interest in bioactive materials. So after that was, was published in 2014, I went back to school and, and completed my master's. And that's the canine study you see on the top that we talked about earlier. We did, uh, we did root canal treatments. We did pulpotomies. We did root in surgeries on a canine model and, and, and observed the wonderful healing that was occurring there. Then I took that and went into private practice. And from there, we just published a study from out of our private practice showing healing uh, using Neo-MTA type products. So again, using bioceramic materials and everyday private practice from both of my partners and I. And then because we were using a lot of these materials, my partners and I were in the forefront, I guess, if you will, of helping to formulate some of the, or refine clinically the Neo-Sierra Flow and the Neo-Putty. Now, I don't have stock in this company or get royalties or anything, but it sure was fun to be able to provide some clinical uh, feedback and say, I'd like this a little bit more this way, or I think this handled better. And so we were able to be in on the, on the ground level of the development of these materials. So that all to say, I've done a lot of my research based in bioceramic and bioactive materials, and that's why I use them in my practice. So here, here I want to show you a few other things that are really critical to their importance in everybody's practice. You know, one is their bioactivity. I've, I've harped on that already, and, and we'll still revisit that a few times. But now, nowadays, most of the bioceramic materials coming out are non-staining. Now, double-check your labels and double-check your, your uh, product contents, but most bioactive root canal type of materials are using zirconia or tantalum, or zirconia or tantalite, rather, as their radio pacifier. And that's great. Those are color stable. Whereas bismuth oxide discolors teeth, as seen in the kind of the left cylinder here. That's classic pro root MTA, white MTA, as a matter of fact. And not to say that that's not wonderfully biologically active. However, the downside is it contains bismuth oxide, which turns colors and stains teeth. These materials are all inherently antibacterial because these are really like medical grade Portland cement. And so you're putting these into a, a moisture rich environment. They're using the water from the dentin tubules from the surrounding tissues and absorbing that and using that as their setting reaction. In the process, they release calcium hydroxide as a byproduct. Well, calcium hydroxide is what we've been using inside root canals for decades to help reduce bacteria and, and, and promote uh, a clean in, uh, intracanal environment. Well, that just happens to be an awesome side finding in bioceramic materials that they release this calcium hydroxide. And last but not least, is these are dimensionally stable materials, if, uh, if not dimensionally stable, slightly expansive. And that's important because almost every material that we use in dentistry shrinks. 
Now that's, we talk about C factor all the time. We think we talk about marginal shrinkage. Well, these materials are the opposite. Bioactive endodontic materials uh, are stable, if not, uh, if, if not slightly expansive. And that's wonderful for the environment in which we're working down inside of root canal space. So the key ingredient, well, most everything, most of the bioactive materials or bioceramic materials today are based off of MTA in some, some form or another. And so that's a good thing. You know, MTA has a track record of over 30 years of showing wonderful healing and millions of cases being, uh, being treated with this. So the main ingredients in MTA type of tricalcium silicates are dye and tricalcium silicate. We have calcium aluminate added into the mixture of several of them. And, and that's important because aluminate, not aluminum, but aluminate helps with things like uh, having a quicker setting reaction. It helps pre prevent acid erosion. And a lot of times working deep inside a canal or right next to a periapical abscess, which has an acidic environment. So if we can have a product that helps resist degradation from the acidic environment, all the better. You know, all of them have an organic liquid, historic ones. You have to add the liquid into the powder yourself. The more modern ones are pre-mixed, but nonetheless, some type of organic carrier and then a radio pacifier. And then the, the proprietary different brands, you know, vary the different mixtures and percentages of each one of these components to get the desired working time and handling and all, all the things like that. And over the past, well, really 15 years or so, since 2008, 2009, we've seen a pre-mixed revolution. And in 2009, that's when Brassler's BC sealer hit the market. And in, in my opinion, that has revolutionized the way we treat teeth endodontically. And since then, we've seen an explosion of other materials come onto the market. So although BC is still around, there are products produced by Septodont, by Avalon, by Edge, by Densply. And so all of these, again, are varying some of those components and uh, in providing bioactive materials. So you may be asking, you know, how do you keep track of these things? Which one should I use? What do I need to know about? Well, first, let's kind of break these down into two very broad categories. They're all, these are all MTA-based sealers, but the group in the top are truly MTA-based sealers, whereas the bottom three in the smaller box are MTA resin sealers. And that's not necessarily desirable, in my opinion, for root canal sealing because we're down in a moisture-rich environment, sometimes an inch or plus down. And so using a lot of composite resin, that can have a, an unpredictable bond in that area. So I'd rather use one that has a much higher uh, content of dye and tricalcium silicate and illuminate and get rid and gets rid of the resin. And so that really leaves us, you know, focusing in this area. And these are probably many of the ones that you've heard of, you know, BioRoot from Septodont, Avalon's NeoSealer, Brassler's BC. And so of these, you know, how, again, how do you keep track of what's going on? And so I wanted to look just a little bit further at three of what I consider to be the, the main players in the game. <clears throat> and, you know, really, what's the difference? Well, these are my three daughters. Again, I have a six-year-old and twin three-year-olds. And, you know, kind of comparing that to the sealers here in the sense that, you know, they're all very, very similar. You know, they all have the same parents. They all look relatively similar. Uh, they all have blue eyes and lighter hair. But it's not until you dive a little bit closer and look a little bit further that you can see there are some distinct differences. You know, the two girls on the left, those are my twins. Uh, they're six minutes apart. The, the, the girl on the right's six years old, so she's a few years ahead of them. And so think of that with when we're looking at the sealers here, where Neo Sealer Flow and Endo Sequence BC have very similar cement contents, and these are all approximate numbers. You know, if you look at the exact manufacturer, if you look at some X-ray diffraction studies, you're going to find a, a broad spectrum. You know, I've seen anywhere between 30 and 65% bioactive cement for both uh, Neo Sealer and, and BC Sealer. So we'll call it roughly 50% bioactive cement. The difference here really resides in the, in the radio pacifier. Neo uses tantalite, Brassler uses zirconia. You know, one's not really better than the other. It's just a different formulation, a different mixture. The one that should really catch your, catch your eye here is the AH plus bioceramic. To me, this really isn't comparing apples to apples with the other two because of the low bioactive or the bio, um, or the cement concentration. And why is that a problem? Well, it's a, it could be a potential problem in the sense that it doesn't have the same biological activity or the bioactivity as the other two. 
one of the things that people like about this age plus bioceramic is that it's really radiopaque, very similar uh, to the age plus of yesteryear. Well, that's great. I like a, I like a radiopaque looking root canal as well. But nowadays, when we're using bioactive materials, in my mind, the bioactivity trumps the radiopacity. And so I'd rather have a higher bioactive cement content than a higher radiopacity. With that said, Avalon and Brassler both have great radiopacities. I've used these one of these two sealers for the past eight years, and, and we've had tremendous results over thousands and thousands of cases. So with these new sealers comes a slight trend in how we're sealing and how we're obturating root canals. And when we were, when many of us were taught in dental school, uh, we were taught to fill as much of the canal space with gutta percha as possible. Well, today it's kind of a, a twist on that in the sense that in 2009, only 3% of endodontists were using a single cone technique. In other words, I'm using a single cone with, with sealer in hopes to fill most of the canal with sealer and use the cone as a hydraulic delivery vehicle. Well, fast forward, you know, now many practitioners, up to 60% of practitioners worldwide are using bioceramic sealer and most often in a single cone technique. I was just in Nepal earlier this year and India and almost everybody there is trying to use bioceramic sealer in a single cone technique. Now, availability is a challenge for those folks. However, that's the desired treatment option because they know the properties of these bioceramic and bioactive materials are superior to what they've been using uh, in decades past. So here's that example of a single cone technique. One on the left and one on the right is just different sealer. But what you notice is I injected the sealer into these plastic blocks and then just seeded the gutta percha cones. And what you're seeing is, yes, we're getting nice little fill into those lateral canals. And everybody knows these plastic blocks, those are easy to fill. But what you're also seeing is you're seeing a nice coating all the way around of the white sealer. You're not really seeing any burn through uh, that's a bright orange spot where the, the gutta perch is in contact. And that's because I want this peripheral surface uh, or the internal surface of the root canal space to be in contact with the bioactive material. Bioinert gutta perch is not doing anything uh, to promote healing inside that tooth. The, the magic is in the sealer. So I want to use that gutta percha cone just as a hydraulic delivery system here. This is a beautiful picture from Dr. Mitu Kohli on the JOE's website, or yeah, on the JOE's website, showing the amount of sealer content and contact with the canal wall versus gutta percha. In years past, this would have been exactly the opposite, where you're trying to, uh, to fill the entire canal space with orange gutta percha, and you see this little bitty halo of sealer. Well, the paradigm has shifted. We're trying to use sealer-centric obturation in our root canals these days. And here's a nice study uh, from Elizabeth Chabowski. This is from Texas A&M College of Dentistry, where I did my uh, residency and master's training. And Elizabeth was four or five years uh, behind me. And, and so Dr. Glickman, you'll see here, was my program director. Dr. Jenny, he's one of my publishing uh, colleagues. And she put together a really nice study where they went into a private practice and they evaluated their success rates. And I think this is great because that's something that we all want to do. They just dug deep and went back into the, into the archives and, and found that overall, they have a, about a 91% success rate with a... Uh, with about a two and a half year recall. That's fantastic. So that's showing that BC Sealer has a has really favorable properties and shows healing at similar, if not slightly higher levels than our historic studies. So that's great. Bioceramic sealer, great success rate, single cone obturation. And so in my practice, we tried to replicate this study as best we could. Um, and we took Neo MTA2, which at that time is a self-mixed product. In other words, it wasn't Brasser's BC sealer where we could inject it in the canals. We had to mix the powder in the liquid. Nonetheless, same biological properties, same tricalcium silicate and aluminate uh, mixture as Neo sealer flow. And what we found was that we too had a success rate that was around 91%. So what that's showing is that our bioceramic materials are, st are, are around, we're able to achieve a high level of success and that's treating our patients with the best and latest and greatest material that's there that now has some literature support. So it's not just all speculation. We now have things to hang our hat on and say, we're seeing healing in teeth with bioceramic materials.
So I had mentioned both BC sealer and Neo sealer flow and that I've used them both for, for quite some time. And here's a case where I use them both in the same tooth. As a matter of fact, this root canal has four different obturation types. What I mean by that is two of the canals, I uh, use Neo sealer flow. And in two of the canals, I use BC sealer. In two of those canals, I used a warm vertical technique or a hybrid technique. And in two of those, I used single cone. So this was just kind of a, an internal nerding out, if you will, uh, with this with this tooth to see, is there really any difference within different roots or different canals of one tooth? What we found was that after one year, it, they were they all had great healing. So it's not like we're seeing failure in one because of the, the technique or not like we're seeing failure in one because of the, the sealer. No, they're both bioceramic materials promoting the same type of healing response. And this was a terrific result for this for this young lady. Now, what I want to again compare or compare and show you is that not all sealers are created equally. So I've talked about the biological properties of Neo Sealer Flow and BC Sealer. Well, here's a really interesting comparison. This study is just taking a, a hot plate uh, from the lab and uh, evaluating how these materials respond to heat. So most of us use about 200 degrees C on our heated pluggers. And so that's what we're going for here. What I want you to, to see is how these materials behave when, when heat's applied. The first one I want you to watch is the bottom right picture. That's the AH plus bioceramic. You can already see it's kind of curled up and it fell over. That means the organic carrier um, is not well tolerated by the heat. And what you'll see in a few minutes is it gets kind of crunchy. The upper right and the lower left well, now you can see these little porosities, these little bubbles starting to occur, and you can even see some brownish tan color developing. And that's telling me that the organic carrier has too low of a melting point, so it's evaporating. And when it turns color and, and the carrier evaporates, that has to change the biological components there. To what extent? I don't know, and I don't think we know. But the neo sealer flow maintains this wonderful sealer consistency the whole way through. So that's one of the reasons why I prefer using this in my private practice, is that I can use a modified heated technique or a cold technique, a single cone, and I, I know I have a sealer that's going to maintain the same chemical properties. So here's just a, a similar test using a couple of different sealers. This time, please focus on the upper right first, and this is diadent sealer. Watch what happens the moment this touches the hot plate. We're seeing this bubbling. We're seeing this boiling. Talk about a, an organic carrier that has a too low uh, melting point. Um, so in this particular case, I don't think that's really suited for any type of warm technique. In the bottom right, that's Edge's bioceramic sealer, and you can see it's behaving very similar to Brathler's product. Um, I believe these to be similar sealers, probably both produced by Innovative Bioceramics, just different labels. Nonetheless, you're seeing very similar characteristics here. And, and so what I want, want you to watch again is at the end how these are manipulated and what they look like. So again, Avalon's, this is the same video, it's behaving the same as it was when it was just deposited. But here, that's breaking up and getting all chunky. So I can't help but think that if you're going to use any type of heat, you have to be careful of which sealer you're using because that changes the property just based on the, the material makeup of the, of the product. And so how many of us end up with this after operating? I mean, me, I certainly do. This is, this is a, a sample case that I did. And one other unique thing about Avalon's Neo Sealer Flow is that the cleanup is super easy. I mean, most of us will take a little cotton pellet with some alcohol on it and kind of scrub the canal walls and whatnot afterward. What I'm here to show you is that you don't even need to do that. You're going to see I'm just using an air water syringe, and pretty soon I turn it to the side because I started splashing back up at my microscope. But I'm just using air water syringe, just a nice little blast here, and you can see that it's rinsing out the sealer from the chamber. But also notice it's not rinsing out the sealer from the canal space. This is what I like to call selective washout. In other words, what's in the canal space remains. You aren't seeing any washout down the, the length of the canals, but you see a chamber that's completely clean. So this is this makes my, my world so much easier. When I'm done with the root canal, just use air water. It rinses out the sealer from the chamber, and now I'm ready for my restoration. And so why is that important? Well, first, ease of use. You know, that just makes my life easy. But secondly, you know, we need to think of what we're doing, and again, think our way through this process. What's the next step? Well, composite bonding to dentin has, has somewhere in the range of 26 megapascals of, of bond strength. Well, composite bonded to bioceramic is an order of magnitude less. 
So if we're going to set our general dentist up for success to place the final restoration, or if we're going to place that final restoration, I want nice, clean dent and walls so that I can bond a, a composite resin restoration that's going to have the maximum strength and provide the best result for that patient. And I heard it best from Dr. Ann Koch, who's an endoprosthodontist or endodontist prosthodontist, which is a very unique combination. Uh, and she said, the restoration starts at the apex. And I've really hung on to that saying ever since, because just, just because I'm an endodontist and I'm doing the root canal down below, I still need to think of what's next for that tooth. I need to think of what the final restoration is going to be, what composite I need to be using. And that goes back to what we talked before. You know, is this a case where it's all internal and I can use a bio inert, you know, if you will, composite? Or is this a case where it may be exposed? And I'd prefer to use a, a bioactive composite resin restoration. So again, thinking our way through the process. So I told you I had been to Nepal earlier this year, and this is a picture that I took, the, the big mountain in the middle with snow drifting off the top, that's Mount Everest. So when I was in Nepal, we took a helicopter up to Everest Base Camp. So that's 17,500 feet, and we were able to get out and, um, and, and I shouldn't say explore, the, we weren't able to go walking around or climbing around because we weren't acclimatized, but nonetheless, we're seeing Mount Everest. That's 29,000 feet or almost 29,000 feet at the peak. And so to me, the pinnacle of bioactivity is resorption in the sense that if we're treating resorption, we really need to think our way through this process, but also use all the materials we have at our disposal to effectively treat this biological process and promote bioactivity and tissue healing. So let me show you a couple, a couple examples of that. So we all know, again, Hither says classifications, class one, two, three, and four. And from our more recent study, we know we're diagnosing surgical resorption more, more commonly these days than we were in the past. But equally, we're, we're, we've noticed that we're diagnosing resorption more commonly in classes three and four as that trend is progressing, as the severity is developing. So although we'd love to diagnose it as class one, those are easy to treat. Unfortunately, we're not, just due to the timing and our, our uh, limited resources, we're not always able to diagnose it as class one. So let's, let's talk about treatment of those other classifications. Oh, here's a tooth that came to me in 2018. And uh, this young lady was kind of on the forefront of my, my treatment with resorption cases. And she said, I really don't want to lose this tooth. My dentist told me there's not enough room for an implant, which, and I don't place implants. I don't have that expertise to tell you that. But she really, she just didn't want to lose her tooth. You know, she really never had a whole lot of restorative work done. She didn't want to lose her tooth the, for the first time because of some process she didn't even fully understand. So I told her, let's try this. And it's kind of one of those, you know, hold my beer and let's try this moments. So I said, well, try doing uh, a couple different things with a few different materials and we'll see how this progresses over time. So I opened the tooth and this is what I found. And when we zoom in, you know, we always kind of hear about resorption in the textbooks. And really, I think the textbooks are pretty accurate. To me, this looks like sea coral, you know, a bunch of little porosities with a bunch of little interconnecting networks inside. So how do you treat that? Well, in my mind, we, re we remove it. I remove as much of the resorption as I possibly can. But we also know that resorption is very acidic because it's odontoclasts that are releasing acid and breaking down this tooth structure. So in my mind, if I can go from an acidic to a basic environment, maybe we can kill off those resorptive cells or at least prevent them from progressing. And we've already talked about a few ways that we can elevate that pH and make it more basic. And that's with bioactive materials. So walking through this case, I treated it, the apical portion that doesn't have resorption in there, just like a conventional root canal with, with the bioceramic sealer and gutta percha. The subcrestal resorption, I treated with bioceramic putty because there's probably some micro perforations that are communicating with the uh, external environment. And that's gonna be bone at that level. So I wanna use the bioactive putty. As soon as I got up above bone, now I want to go back and use a glass ionomer because if there's any potential perforations, I want to promote that epithelial attachment in that area. So again, we're thinking our way through this process, subcrestal versus supercrestal, what materials can we use to promote bioactivity in these areas? So this lady again was lost to, re uh, to recall, but she showed up for another, another tooth a few years later, and here's what we found. So we have our pre-op CT and a three-year recall. So we have apical healing, yes. But most importantly, we don't have any progression of the resorption. 
yeah, there's a couple little porosities in there where there was resorptive, uh, where there was a resorptive defect and uh, our filling material didn't quite fill those spaces. And that's okay. Because to me, it's more important about the biological process that's occurring than it is about the density of that fill. Think about what I commented on earlier about the radio opacity versus biological activity. I want the biological activity because that's really what's going to help this tooth heal long term. And so here's one more case. And, and this case was very unique and interesting because the lady who presented uh, accepted my treatment initially of saying, I think you should extract this tooth. You know, at, at this point in time, I, I told her, I really don't know that there's a lot of good things that can come from treating this. So I recommended she extract it. And, and she thought, great, that's no problem. She, she uh, left and was going to make arrangements to have the tooth extracted and replaced. And then about a week later, I saw her show up on my schedule again. And, and, and again, I didn't really know what to think because I already told her to extract it. She left, was going to make arrangements, and now she's back again. Well, you know, come to find out, she changed her mind. She wanted me to treat this tooth. And so I said, you know, ma'am, I, I think the prognosis here is very uncertain, but I'm willing to go down this path with you if, if you just understand the, the expectations are very low here. You know, maybe we're trying to save this for a few months, if, if maybe a year. So she said, okay, that's fine. I'd still like you to try to save this tooth. Okay, so what we did is first, you know, we had to remove as much of the resorption as possible. And the resorption in the body have already really removed the cingulum. You can see the, uh, the gingival ingrowth into this space. So what I did is I clamped, uh, placed my rubber dam clamp down below. I removed the, the overgrown gingiva with uh, electrocautery here. I removed as much of the resorption as possible, and you can still see some of the little specks there of little uh, resorption micro canals. But what we did here is first I had to recreate some type of cingulum to maintain a clinical isolation. And so I used glass ionomer. We used glass ionomer because this was the tissue or the material that was going to be directly in contact with the epithelium on the lingual surface. So I just rebuilt that wall all with glass ionomer. After that, you can see there's a little uh, apical plug inside there. So I started to, to fill this tooth with NeoMTA2. And again, we had talked briefly earlier that it, this is the self-mix, the powder and the liquid. And so mix those two together, and I place that into the, into the tooth. I place that in, on every level of the tooth that's subcrestal. So all the way up to the crestal bone, I placed that tissue or that material. From there up, what I used is just simply glass ionomer. I just continued uh, my restoration internally with glass ionomer because, again, if there's anything that's that's leaking or if there's any potential breakaway, I want glass ionomer to be the material to be in contact with the gingiva. So what did we find? Well, again, a quick recap of treatment. Build the cingulum up, treat the tooth with bioactive materials. Here she is showing back up on, on a two-year recall. You can see here, yes, again, we have apical healing. To me, that's the easy part here. What you can see in my mind that's more important is you can see that the gingiva is now healed up against all of that glass ionomer restoration. So we promoted epithelial attachment. We used bioactive material to promote osseous healing. And then we used glass ionomer to stimulate epithelial attachment. This lady, uh, although I can't get her to come back in for a recall because she's stubborn, we'd be about five years out right now. And she tells me every time I call, Ryan, the two's still there. It's not giving me any trouble and I'm still using it just like I was before. So we know it's asymptomatic and functional. And as soon as I get a, a, a five-year recall, I'll be sure to show you guys. So again, resorption, you know, the difference between what's above, what's below, to me, that's the epitome of bioactivity, but those same principles carry over to our, to our daily treatment of root canals, as well as coronal restoration. So Super crestally, we want glass ionomer or a bioactive restoration or a bioactive resin. Something is going to promote epithelial attachment. And with, with resins, something is going to prevent caries and, and allow buffering of the local environment. And subcrestally, we're going to want a bioceramic putty or sealer uh, to promote the hard tissue healing down in those hard to reach places. So again, we're thinking our way through. We're not just doing conventional treatment because that's how we've done it before. We're thinking our way through and using these bioactive materials in very specific locations to maximize the benefit of each one and overall promote healing of that tooth. Okay, so, so what's up now? What, where do we go next? Well, when I'm done with a root canal, 
you know, this is really what I'd like to like to say. I'd like to call up my dentist, be like, hey, man, I'm done. Great, thanks. And, th and have it be the end of the story. But we all know that's that's not the case. You know, if you think about the patient's experience, once she leaves my office or once she's done with me, she then sees my assistant for post-ops. She then checks out at the front. She then goes to the general dentist's office and then sees the general dentist. And so although it should be just as simple, or you'd think it would be as simple as me calling my general dentist, there's a lot more to this circle of communication to make sure that everybody is on the same page and everything is being done in the correct order. And that's that's to say that all of us, meaning all of our dental team, both the front and the back, not only at the specialist office, but at the GP office, are all part of this patient experience. And that seems to be kind of a, a buzz phrase these days is patient experience. And I think that's true. You know, we've all gone to you know, McDonald's versus Chick-fil-A, or we've all gone to a Holiday Inn versus uh, Four Seasons. Those, pay, those customer experiences are just so much better at the Chick-fil-A and at the Four Seasons compared to the McDonald's and the Holiday Inn. And so patients see our offices very similarly. So I want to share with you an experience uh, and a, a patient experience in a case where I think we handle things very well and then kind of play off of this with where to move next. And so let me ask you again, what do you see? Well, this patient was referred to me for evaluation of tooth number 24. And that's fine and dandy. I'm happy to take a look and see what's going on. And we made a CBCT. And what do we see with the CBCT? Well, what we found was that, yeah, tooth number 24 has severe resorption, but tooth 25 also has cervical resorption. So I had the, the wonderful pleasure of breaking it to the patient that, yeah, you have one tooth that I don't know if we can restore it, but you have a tooth right next door that also has the same process. And so in my mind, you know, where do you go next? Because this patient just wants to, to wring my neck because he went from not really having a whole lot of dental needs to having resorption, but not only just resorption on one tooth, but on another tooth. And so you have these conversations of, you know, do you treat one of the teeth with resorption? I thought 24 was beyond my repair, 25 maybe, but in a lower anterior, is this something you extract the teeth and just replace them with an implant? I don't know. And so I wanted to get in touch with both the general dentist but also importantly, I wanted to get in touch with the perio because all of this starts with the general dentist and I'm happy to be a role player as an endodontist and Dr. Betacek's happy to be a role player as the perio, but it all is a circle of communication really revolving around the dentist and his patient or her patient for that matter. So I referred him over to perio and the perio, I was thinking, well, maybe just place an implant at site 24, call it a day. You know, if, if that's the case, well, I can root canal 25 and and we can be off to the races and just place an implant crown. Well, there's a reason I don't place implants and because that's not my area of expertise. Dr. Betacek came back and said, well, uh, I don't think there's any, there, I don't think there's enough space to place an implant at site 14. So he and I talked, and then we talked with our friend Chad Duplantis, the general dentist. And what we kind of came up with was that, all right, I can do a root canal on 25, 24 needs to be extracted, but what are we going to do at, at site 24 to replace that? Well, Dr. Duplantis came up with a great idea of doing a Maryland bridge. So I took care of the root canal for him. No, no problem there. But in the meantime, he had tooth number 24 extracted, a little cold steel and sunshine, never hurt anybody, did the root canal. And here's where he was after my root canal. And in, at this time, I referred him back to Dr. Duplantis to do the final restoration. And some of you may be familiar with this type of software. I was not, but I think it's awesome how he was able to shade match and digitally recreate these renderings of what the occlusal scheme will look like because I didn't remember a lot about Maryland Bridges, but I did remember that they are, there's very specific criteria for them and occlusion is a main consideration to see even if that's a possible or a feasible option for this particular case. And it was. I mean, I think this is a beautiful final product, uh, and the patient was happy. We had great communication between the three of us, and everybody was happy. But let, again, let's kind of think of the overall picture from a patient's perspective of who's who's all involved in this communication process. Well, patients talk to the front office. They then go to the assistants and hygienists, and then the dentists. So the dentist is really the end of the line in communication from the patient standpoint, because that's not who you walk in and see. 
well, throw me into the mix. And not only do they not know me, but they have to drive to a different office to see me. So I think the front office and the, the dental assistants are, and hygienists for that matter, are critical people in the communication of our offices because they're the gatekeepers, both into the office, but then into the back where treatment's rendered. And so these are the, the really critical uh, players in our team because they are some of the first interactions the patient has. You know, think of you know, like getting them back and, and taking radiographs. Um, you know, they're gonna scan and uh, input things into into the patient's charts on my end as far as the front office. But assistants and hygienists, you know, they're making the first impression clinically of putting radiographs into patients' mouths. You know, are they rough? Are they are they gentle? Are they nice and friendly? I mean, I think all of these things play in to this overall patient experience. You know, again, you go to a Holiday Inn versus a Four Seasons. The Four Seasons, everybody's happy and smiley and uh, how can I help you? What can I do to make your experience better? You know, as opposed to, you know, the Holiday Inn where they're, you know, just, that's just not the level of service that they provide. So communication in my office, you know, I'm an endodontist, so I don't have hygienists. I have front office assistants and doctors. So in my office, when I get this resorption case, uh, Renee, Serena, and Nikki send, uh, send a message back to me saying, hey, will you take a look at this film, see what's going on? You know, in years past, it was just sticky notes or something, and it, that's fine. Uh, but there's a lot of room to, for things to get lost in translation, for me to overlook it. I have to be at the office when they're trying to communicate with me, and that just makes things a pain in the butt. But over the last few years, we've... Uh, adopted Weave software. And I was just talking with Dr. Attar today about how the team chat is such an awesome feature because now if they get a radiograph in that has resorption, they just shoot me a message via Weave. It shows up on my cell phone, whether I'm at the office or not. I can pull it up, look at a radiograph real quick and get back in touch with them and say, okay, I can treat 24 or in this particular case, I can't treat 24. Let's take a look at 25 and we'll, we'll make this a consult. So that takes, takes away the need for them to write a note and put it on my desk, which I may overlook in the first place, but it also provides an area uh, where I don't have to be at the office and it's consistently documented. To me, that's worth its weight in gold. So as they communicate to me, I relay my message back to them. Well, they communicate with the patient. And so they're able to do this all via the phone or messages. Many times these days, we're doing it all via text. And so the ladies up front can text from their Weave portal, which is our office. So I can see every text and call that they send uh, or make, but they're sending that to the patient. And patients have been very receptive with text messaging. As a matter of fact, most people will mark that on their chart that that's a preferred method of communication. So what the patient perceives is that they've talked directly with me. They've reached out to my office. Behind the scenes, my office has communicated with me via uh, the the Weave chat, I've communicated back, and now they're able to tell that patient in real time what's expected, what the doctor sees, and now that can kind of help guide treatment as far as, is this a consultation only? Is this a CT scan? Is this something that I'm comfortable doing same day treatment on? So that just bridged the patient communication gap so that they feel like they're in direct communication with me, although there's a couple proxies involved. And in this particular case with the resorption on 24 and 25, the fact that Dr. Duplantis, Dr. Betacek, and I can all be on the same page communicating effectively, again, not always when we're in the office. Sometimes we're shooting messages back and forth uh, in the evenings after, after our kids go to bed. But that full circle communication provides a highly, uh, provides a, a high level of, of patient care because the patient is directly communicating with us all the time. And so here's a picture of Dr. Duplantis and I out fishing. Um, we have become friends because of dentistry. And that's something that's that's pretty unique to our field is that because we've communicated so much uh, in cases just like this, that now he's not only a good referral, but we're also friends on the outside. And so patients see that and they really see the, the genuine friendship between Dr. Duplantis, Betacek, and I. And I think that provides a great lasting relationship for our patients as well. And here's that same patient on a one-year recall with their Maryland Bridge, no increasing resorption, apical healing, happy patient, aesthetic result, and happy dentist. But just because that patient's done with me, he's done with his treatment, well, his experience isn't over. You know, from my perspective, once they're done with the root canal, he still had a few steps left before he was done with his treatment. 
And so it's okay to talk to our patients after they leave. As a matter of fact, we care call every single patient that we complete treatment on the next day or two days following. We make sure it's within two days. And we do all of that again via the Weave, via the Weave app. And the reason why is because we have some preset forms that we can send out, and I'll show you a couple of those. But also, I can see that my front desk has called this patient, and if they don't uh, speak with the patient directly, they send a text message just asking how they're doing and following up, and we can then take that and input that directly into the patient's chart. So not only is there documentation that it happened, but then the communication can then be input into the patient's chart as part of their official record saying, we have reached out. We did touch base. You were doing fine one to two days after your treatment. So to me, that adds a valuable component to our patient experience that we're providing uh, and, and makes the patient feel that, that we're really going the extra mile to, to make sure that, that we care for them. And then the reciprocal is true. So we're reaching out, finding our patients. But, you know, we're talking about all these bioactive, bioceramic materials doing high-level dentistry. Well, that's great. But if we're not effective communicators, you know, how are patients really going to find us? You know, we can be the best dentist in the world, but if we're, if we're lacking in communication, we're going to have a hard time filling our chair because we don't have the patient contact or patient awareness to get in. And so I thought this this billboard is hilarious. This is actually on I-35 over in Dallas, very close to me. I see this when I'm driving into the dental school. So I make sexy teeth. And, you know, that's one way to reach out and find your patients. But I would say by and large, uh, most patients are probably going to the internet. And I can tell you, I'm not making a billboard anytime soon. And so one thing that, that we do, not only reaching out for a care call, but we know patients are searching the web. They know We know they're Googling us. And one thing that we've done since having the Weave software, is we've been a lot more effective at reaching out and getting getting reviews. And so I'm not a re review guru or anything like that, but this is the, the message that we send. Uh, and I, I send it usually personally after I'm done with our treatment and to send this out. And over the past year, our review rate has gone way up. We went from, you know, the last couple of years anyway, we went from 20 to 40 organic reviews to about 160 or so, or 150. I can't remember what the exact number was. But although they're still organic in the sense that the patient's still writing it on their own time, they're not doing it in office, it's really helped communicate between we and they to make sure that they know that their input is important. And so the reason why I like sending out a review message via text is that 90% of people are, are responding to a text within three minutes. You know, that's, that's an incredibly efficient mode of uh, communication because think about an email. How many emails do you have sitting in your inbox right now that are unread? Do you have a few hundred? Do you have a few thousand? I mean, I've seen some that are 20,000 just sitting there that are unread emails. And so text messages is, these days is a much more effective communication tool to get patient reviews. And I'm really not looking for a giant quantity of reviews. I'm looking, or, um, I'm looking for quality. In other words, I want somebody who's going to give a, a little description, tell me about their experience, tell me why they had a good time. And to me, those reviews mean so much more because that's what I look for when, when I'm looking for a, a new doctor, when I'm looking for a restaurant, when I'm looking for anything that has a Google review. So I'm looking for somebody who's going to give a little bit of narrative to it. And so this has really helped our review game and our online presence over the past year or two since we've been using Weave. So just a quick recap of the objectives, you know, starting with the crown down, you know, bioactive, bioinductive materials are important. You know, biomimetic, Again, I think we're talking semantics here at this level, but nonetheless, having bioactivity in your practice is critical because that will uh, that will provide your patients with the highest level of care, but it will also increase your game and, and allow you to perform procedures potentially that you hadn't been able to before, or at least make those procedures more predictable because you're using the right materials for the right jobs. Again, think of cuspidization next time you have a palatal root or a palatal cusp fracture of a maxillary premolar. That's a great way to use a glass ionomer to promote that epithelial reattachment and allow for a conservative cost-effective approach for your patient. And the, you know, the restoration truly, truly starts at the apex because everything that we do in the root canal space and, and, and me as an endodontist is setting up a foundation for a coronal restoration. So it starts at the apex, but we need to think our way through because if we're treating something like resorption, that's a little bit more complex process, we have the materials to treat it. 
We just have to make sure we're getting the right material in the right location to do the right job. And nowadays with bioactive sealers, you know, we're doing a sealer centric operation. So single cone is okay. Single cone is a good thing. And, and, and we're seeing good success rates with our, our newest studies coming out on that. And then last but not least, be a good communicator. I would assume that we're all good dentists, but we need to be good communicators as well. And our teams, our, our front office and our assistants and hygienists are those first points of contact that really make the patient experience sing at your office. And secondly, interdisciplinary approaches really elevate the level of care. Being a good communicator, not only with my patients, not only to my, my office team, but also to the, the dentist and my colleagues surrounding, really up the level of patient care and make it a seamless transition. And, and for that, the patients receive the best possible care. And last but not least, follow up and ask for reviews. I don't like doing it in person simply because I don't want to sell somebody to write a review for me. So I just send them a message afterward. And we've provided an awesome portal to send a text message that's very uh, nonchalant that the patient can get. And they can either write a review then or, or carve out a little time to write it later. But it's an effective communication tool that we should all be using. And so with that, Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. Uh, and if you need to get in touch with me, here's my email, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. So don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I'll turn the turn the mic back over. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. There are some questions coming in, but before I get to those, I'd like again to invite viewers to use the question and answer feature in the control panel on your screen to ask any questions you have. We have some communications questions. Um, has the way you communicated with your team changed in the last five years? You, you did say a little bit about that, but can you say some more? Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, as far as you know, communicating with my team, absolutely. You know, I had mentioned a little bit before that we're using uh, the, the, the Weave software to communicate front to back. Uh, and that's been incredibly valuable because it's more efficient. And again, one thing that I think is brilliant is that I don't have to be at the office for them to reach out. And it's not just a text message anymore, which text messaging is fine. But now I can take that information that's on the Weave software and directly input that into my patient chart. And then I have track record of me communicating. I can copy and paste and send it right over to my colleague, Dr. Attar, Dr. Turner, if they're in office. And so, yeah, we're using, utilizing the intra-office communicating software a, a lot more than just writing a sticky note and putting it back on my desk uh, that sometimes can get overlooked. So Yes, that's changed the dynamic of how we're communicating within the office, but also outside of the office, uh, being able to reach out to patients via text message uh, it has been a game changer for us, both for confirming appointments, just for checking on patients afterward with care calls, uh, as well as reaching out for reviews. Hey, uh, what are your thoughts on the doctor directly calling or texting the patient pre, post, or post-op versus the office staff? Yeah, I, I think we do we do some of both, you know, for kind of the uh, the majority of straightforward cases, my office staff usually or my office team usually reaches out and, and checks in to see how they're doing the following day. If there was a case that was really challenging or there was uh, some, you know, maybe a severe infection or a surgical procedure, I always do the reaching out uh, because I want to make sure that if there are any more in-depth questions that I'm there on the front, uh, on the front line to help answer those and make sure that we're providing the effective communication. So we do a combination of both. How do you avoid intra-office miscommunication? Does mm -hmm. technology lead to more miscommunication versus in person? Um, I, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um, sometimes miscommunication is challenging. I mean, just because you tell somebody something doesn't mean that's what they heard. And so I do think the software or the digital communication has been more effective because you can go back and reference a conversation you had previously, as opposed to if they just wrote a sticky note, A, I might overlook it on my desk or vice versa. If I write one to my office manager, you know, she's working on claims and she's working on HR and a bunch of other things. And so that may get overlooked, but if she can go back onto her, her, communication software and see, oh, okay, I'm, I meant to, to follow up with Dr. Walsh on this or vice versa. Oh, I forgot to look at that radiograph Renee was asking about. Let me pull that up. So I think it provides a, a, a better avenue for our office to effectively communicate, but also remind ourselves and have a track record of what we've already talked about. So nothing's being redundant or nothing's being overlooked. 
Okay. Um, when, thank you. Uh, when is it best to get patient feedback? Immediately post visit or wait a few weeks after healing? So uh, I think the review experts will tell you immediately. The best time to do it is in office immediately. Uh, and I, I'm not a review expert, so I don't want to dispute that information. But in my opinion, I don't like being put on, on the spot when I'm in an office and they give me an iPad saying, please write a review. I, I, I politely decline to say, I'll write it later. And that gives me time to think of the verbiage and think of how I want to construct this. Because again, to me, just clicking five stars and posting review, that really doesn't say much. That doesn't tell anybody about my experience. So I'd really like time to think of and compose a thought, but also some of the procedures we do both endodontically and, and in dentistry and as a whole don't have immediate results or some of them don't. And so I don't necessarily want the patient's feedback on what they thought the process was immediately afterwards. Maybe I want them to see that healing two weeks out. And so that's why I usually send the message uh, a day or two afterwards, usually after a care call, that's when I'll send the the review text because then the patients had time to digest and and kind of get a sense of what their experience was truly like. Do you see any resistance from office staff from different ages on adopting intra-office or patient communication strategies? <laughs> um, uh, not really, uh, and 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 that's probably a little bit biased from from my office in the sense that we're all relatively young and we've become accustomed to using a lot of digital technology. Uh, ever since our office was uh, was started, it's been a digital office. So that's kind of a loaded question coming from my office, but no, I haven't really had a whole lot of pushback or feedback or a, or a hesitancy from my office staff to, to adopt new technologies. Okay, back to bioceramic sealer. Uh, how do you choose the right bioceramic sealer? Um, again, another great question. And, and again, you're getting a biased opinion for somebody who's done a lot of research on a few particular products. And so, but things that I think you have to keep in mind are, you know, first, what are your intents with the with the with the sealer? Uh, you know, are you trying to do single cone? Are you trying to do warm vertical? Because again, not like we saw earlier with those videos, not all sealers are the same. And so some are more suited to doing a combination of different techniques. You know, Neo Sealer Flow is a really versatile sealer and it works well in my hands. Combine that with the track record uh, of uh, peer-reviewed literature. I think it's a, it's an amazing product. Brassler BC Sealer has been around for 14 years now or so, 15 years, uh, and has a great track record as well. Other things to keep in mind are cost. Um, you know, although we're in the healthcare business, we still have to think about the bottom line, even though we're trying to treat our patients with the highest level of care. That, yeah, we're still running a business. And so uh, price has to go into, into comparison as well. And so those are just a few factors to take into consideration when you're trying to pick the one. Uh, but hopefully after tonight, you have a little bit clearer idea of how to narrow it down to at least a few to choose from. Uh, and our last question, what bioactive composites are on the market? Hmm. Uh, um, that's a challenging question. Uh, I know that Activa was one of the first to come out uh, and promote bioactivity, although I think a lot of that has been disputed on the um, uh, in, in some of the literature. So I wouldn't necessarily call that bioactive uh, composite. I know Shofu has a bioactive composite that one of my good colleagues, Dr. Ankur Gupta, likes to use. I like Regen uh, because to me, again, that that works well in my hands. Uh, it's biologically active where I'm I'm in the process and, and helping to develop some of the research for that. And so we're seeing these good things develop over time. So to me, uh, the Regen products from Vista Apex are or at the forefront of the bioactive composite market. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for your questions, but we've run out of time today. Um, if we did not get to your question, we will answer it after the webinar via email. Uh, within one hour, all registrants will be emailed a link to the replay and continuing education quiz to complete for the certificate. Again, thank you for attending, and a special thank you to Dr. Ryan Walsh for a really great presentation and our sponsor for this webinar, Weave. Thank you and stay safe out there.